for life. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Committee of Adjustment and regular council meeting for Monday, July the 13th. Uh, we have a very lengthy agenda tonight. We have a committee of adjustment meeting, uh, which we will call to order first, uh, go through those matters, adjourn that meeting, and then call to order the, uh, the regular council meeting. Uh, but before we do begin, um, I, I know that there are, are maybe a, a number of people watching um, to, to see the report regarding the, uh, the OPP costing proposal. Um, what we've done in that regard um, is I, I have called a special meeting for this coming Wednesday. Uh, at 8.30. Uh, it, it will also be conducted via Zoom and streamed live to the town's uh, YouTube channel. So any discussion regarding the staff report uh, with respect to the OPP costing is going to be deferred from tonight's meeting to the meeting on Wednesday, uh, July the 15th at 8.30. So that's item number five on the council's agenda. So anybody who's tuned in only for that, um, you know, you, you don't have to wait around for, uh, for a report that's not going to be discussed today. So with that, I will call the Committee of Adjustment meeting to order. Uh, tonight, we have two public meetings under Section 45, Sub 5 of the Planning Act to consider two minor variance applications. First minor variance, which is application A20-01, is for the property located at 437 First Avenue East in the town of Shelburne. And the purpose and effect of this application is to request, request relief from the Town of Shelburne zoning bylaw in order to construct a private garage attached to the existing single detached dwelling. The second minor variance application, which is application A20-02, is for the property located at 485387 Side Road 30 in the Town of Shelburne. And the purpose and effect of this application is to request relief from the town of Shelburne zoning bylaw in order to facilitate a proposed addition of 3,707 square meters to an existing industrial building. I'll ask the clerk for the method of notice for tonight's public meeting. Notice of tonight's public meeting was advertised in local media sources as of June 18th, 2020. Notice was posted on the town's website and property owners within a 60 meter radius have received notification. So we will have a presentation by the town planner with a summary of written comments received, following which there will be an opportunity for comments, uh, both from the Committee of Adjustment members um, to, to, to provide comments. Uh, and, and with that, I guess we'll just go through. We'll start with uh, the first application, Steve. So if you want to walk us through that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can everybody hear me okay? Just give me a thumbs up. Okay. Um, I do have a presentation to share with a few slides, so I'm going to try to share that now. Okay, should be shared now. Um, Jennifer, maybe just give me the thumbs up or somebody if you can see it. Can you see the presentation? Okay, thank you. Okay, so as the chair mentioned, the first application um, for tonight's Committee of Adjustment is A2001. Uh, this application was filed by Jessica Bondi and Tyler White, the owners of 437 First Avenue East. The property is located near the corner of First Avenue East and Greenwood Street, to the west of Greenwood Street, north of Main Street East or Highway 89. Um, it's in a residential area, uh, an established residential area um, and the property also backs on a rear lane um, that has a secondary access to some of the properties. Um, behind the property is an existing commercial plaza use and a gas station to the southeast. This is a couple of Google images, uh, maybe a bit dated now, but this is the existing house on the property. Um, as you can see, this is a typical house of the, of the era and the style in the neighborhood. Um, this particular house um, does not have an existing attached garage, unlike many of the others in the neighborhood. Um, the owners would like to add a garage to the house and there is a wider side yard on the, um, this uh, drawing is flipped upside down, but it's, um, 
on the one side of the dwelling, there is a, uh, a wider side yard that has some room and they would like to um, build a attached garage on the side of the house. Um, so currently there is approximately uh, 3.7 meters between the side wall of the existing house and the um, side lot line. The interior side lot line is shown in red. Um, the driveway comes right up to that space and extends partly beside the house. Um, what's shown here, the image on the left is just a zoomed out um, picture, um, air photo of the entire lot, um, showing the two adjoining dwellings. Um, and you can see there's a fairly narrow side yard and roof setback on the uh, on this side um, where the existing house next door um, uh, has an existing um, side yard between the two homes. And on the other side, there is a much wider gap. Um, the owners would like to use that gap to construct an attached garage. The garage would have 3.3 uh, meters of width or about 11 feet. Uh, so basically a single car garage um, and a depth that would be the same length as the existing house. Um, so 8.5 meters or 28 feet long. In order to fit that single car garage in that space, uh, they are requesting relief through this variance application from three zoning bylaw provisions. Um, the first zoning bylaw provision where relief is requested is related to this dash line. That's approximately the location of the roof overhang of the proposed attached garage. Um, the zoning bylaw provides that a roof overhang um, or eave may be as close as 0.6 meter or two feet to the side lot line. Um, the owners in this case are requesting to have that eave or overhang extend right to the lot line. Um, so the building wall itself is shown in the solid yellow line and the proposed building um, would be 0.4 meter or about 16 inches from the side lot line. Um, in addition, there is obviously some space on the adjoining property. However, the owners are not proposing that they would use the neighbor's property to access their rear yard from the front or vice versa, um, that the 16 inches would give them the space to walk along the side of their new garage and also to uh, provide any maintenance of that side yard. The eave, as it would be right along the lot line, um, as in, is it the case in, in some lots and some developments, um, would drain to the front and or back. So there would be no downspouts pointing to the side yard and likewise maintenance of that eave would be from the front or back unless the consent of the neighbor was given to the owners to access the eave uh, for clean out or repair from, from the adjoining property. So this table summarizes the requested variances um, and also on the left-hand side of the slide, this is the sketch provided by the applicants. Um, obviously the sketch is not to scale, the garage is much um, longer than it is wide, so 28 feet long and 11 feet wide. Um, as I mentioned, the first variance request would reduce the side lot line setback for the roof eave on the one side from 0.6 meter to point to um, zero setback. Um, and the other variance is really for the same purpose, it's just two different provisions of the zoning bylaw. The first is relief from the 1.2 meter side yard requirement of section 325X. Um, which requires 1.2 meters, whereas 0.4 meters is proposed. And then similarly, the R2 zone requires a side yard of 1.2 meters and 0.4 meters proposed for the garage. Um, these images are provided in our report, which is in the agenda package. Um, it just gives some examples to illustrate other similar um, garages that have been added or constructed as part of the original dwellings um, on other lots on the same street or in the same area. Um, as you can see, other homeowners have added garages. Um, and in some case, um, there have been previous um, reductions in the side yards. Uh, it's not reflected in the current zoning bylaw. I believe it must have been dealt with at the time of the original dwelling construction or um, 
when the garages were added where, where there was some additions. But you can see the typical spacing between some of the existing homes is quite narrow. And uh, this would have similar spacing as those other lots in the area. So that's uh, the slides that I have for the presentation. I just wanted to make note of a few other things from the report. Um, the application was circulated in accordance with the Planning Act. There were no comments or concerns received through the circulation. The County of Dufferin um, provided planning comments uh, indicating that the property is within a source protection plan area for a wellhead protection zone. Um, the risk management official uh, who comments on those matters was also circulated and has no concerns with the construction of an attached garage um, from a source water protection protective perspective. Um, the applicants had also indicated that they spoke with the neighbor on the side of the proposed garage and that that neighbor did not indicate any concerns. We have not received any indication of any concerns from that neighbor or others in the neighborhood, uh, but the purpose of tonight's meeting is to hear comments from anyone who wishes to speak to this application. Um, I don't believe we have anyone who has registered to speak. Um, I believe the applicants are maybe in the Zoom call, um, but at this point, I'll return it to you, Mr. Chair, uh, to run the balance of the meeting and I'm available to help with answering any questions. Thank you. Great, thanks, Steve. Um, can I just have the full screen back up? I, I can't see everybody. Perfect. Okay, so, so as, as Steve said, there, there are no um, public members that have, have registered for this call to, to, to ask questions. Um, are there any questions from any member of council, Steve? Councillor Feagan. Uh, first question I have is, you didn't mention any kind of door being proposed as far as this garage. They, they did say that they weren't interested in using their side spacing for accessing the rear yard. Are they proposing a back door to this garage? Um, we haven't um, received detailed building plans yet. Um, so I don't know the answer to that, but um, the applicants may be able to answer that. Mr. Chair, if you, I don't know if you want to redirect that question to the Okay, applicant. yeah, yeah, I see uh, Tyler signed on here. So, yeah, so, so um, committee member Feagan has, has raised the issue that, you know, now that essentially the access to your backyard will be restricted by the construction of the new garage, have you contemplated adding a door in the back of the garage structure to, to allow you to still maintain access? Yeah, that is the plan. Um, our, our gateway to our backyard is in that space right now. So there would be a door at the rear of the garage where we could access our backyard. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Member Feagan? No, that's good, thanks. Okay. Uh, committee Member Bonato. You're there. there you go. I got myself unmuted. Um, I wanted a question on the side because of the eaves are right onto the property line. Is there a swale in between there? Something in case water comes off the roof beyond whatever the eaves can handle? Um, we did discuss that among staff and um, I had talked to uh, Jim about it in particular and he did visit the property to look at the existing rating and indicated that uh, you know if the roof leaders are directed to the front and the back um, there should be no issue with the drainage along the side um, i'm not sure if there is a a swale um, or if a swale will exist after the um, garage is constructed between the two yards uh, but there is still some space between uh, what would become a wall of the garage and uh, the adjoining neighbor's home to receive uh, drainage um, the intent would be that the, the eaves, though, would, would direct the roof drainage for a fairly small roof area to the front and the back and not have it flowing onto the neighbor's property. If you um, were here Friday night with the storm that we had, yeah. it was pouring down. Even my eaves around my house were not handling the amount of water that was coming down that particular night. We do get some intense storms from time to time. Yeah. It does flood out. It flooded out even the side where I have the swales. So my concern is that the neighbor is probably a great neighbor right now and working with, with uh, Tyler on, on the, you know, the house and the garage. 
it's just that down the road, I don't want somebody coming back to town council saying, why did you allow that to happen? And my property is now flooded. So that's my only concern. If there was a swale there or something to redirect the water out away from the own, the other, the neighbor's property, that would be a little easier on my conscience anyway. Yeah, there will be a lot grading uh, plan required prior to uh, municipal approval of a building permit. So we would certainly review that further uh, to make sure that, you know, grading any surface runoff, um, you say in a severe storm event, like you're, the one you're talking about, um, you know, that that would carry that to a proper outlet and not cause any ponding issues on the adjoining property. Um, so that's something we can definitely look at further and ultimately is required anyway prior to uh, permit approvals. Okay, that, that makes me a little happier. Okay. Any other questions from the committee? No. Okay. So, so our, our planners recommended that, uh, that, that we approve this. So I'll read the, uh, the draft resolution. Be a resolve that the Committee of Adjustment receives report P2020-06 for information and that subject to the consideration of any input received at the public meeting, it is recommended that the Committee of Adjustment grant approval of minor variance application A20-01 for the property municipally known as 437 First Avenue East and legally described as Block 29, part of Lot 26 and Lot 25 on Plan 12A in the Town of Shelburne, County of Dufferin to permit a reduction in the required westerly minimum interior side yard for an attached private garage from the required 1.2 meters to 0.4 meter and to permit a reduction in the required minimum setback for the eaves of an attached private garage from the required 0.6 meter to 0 meter along the west interior side lot line only for an attached garage having a maximum height of 4.5 meters and a maximum dimensions of 3.3 meters in width and 8.5 meters in length. Do I have a mover and seconder for that? Moved by committee member Buffett, seconded by committee member Bonato. Any further discussion on that? All in favor? Any opposed? No, that's carried, okay. Uh, Madam Clerk, I'll, I'll let you fill in the, uh, the mover and seconder on the form. Your, your handwriting is likely a lot neater than mine. Uh, so Steve, uh, you want to take us through the second application? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the second application I've just shared, um, so hopefully you should see that. Is it on screen now? Not yet. You seeing it now? There we go. Yeah. Okay, great. So the second application was filed by Loft Planning on behalf of Got Enterprises Inc., the owners of 485387 Dufferin County Road 11 or 30th Side Road. Uh, this is a Blue Mountain Plastics operation. So the subject property for this application is located at the northwest corner of um, the two segments of County Road 11, um, locally known as uh, 30th side road on um, the south and second line on the east. Uh, this is right at the town limit uh, across the road uh, on second line um, is Fiddle Park and to the south is agricultural land in Township of Amaranth. Um, to the north is KTH and to the west is um, the industrial park where um, Ice River Springs is currently constructing a water bottling operation. So this uh, original building uh, dates back several years, the main building labeled on the, on the plan here um, and Blue Mountain Plastics uh, has been operating there for, for a number of years now as well. Um, in 2017, Blue Mountain Plastics uh, filed applications including variance and site plan approval for a second building. You can see on the air photo that second building is shown in white and a portion of that building at the back, you can see um, is a little bit taller, well, more than twice as high. Um, 
uh, and that's for a specific piece of industrial equipment used in their extrusion operation. So this image just shows uh, the location of that second building and the proposed addition to it. So the expansion would essentially double the size of that existing building and maintain the same height profile. So the back um, small section of the building would have that same 22 and a half meter height, whereas the balance of the, of the building would be within the 10 meter height limitation of the zoning bylaw. Um, so in 2017, there was a variance granted only for the increased height of that building that now exists on the property. Um, the current application is to allow, again, that same uh, relief from the zoning bylaw height requirements to allow that uh, building to be doubled in size. Um, so another 520 square meters of floor area with that 22 and a half meter height limit and the rest of that um, building uh, addition would have uh, would be within the 10 meter height. This just provides a little bit more detail of the building and of the proposed addition in the south or sorry the northwest corner of the property. Um, and again, the two areas um, with the increased height, the existing part, and then shown in yellow, the, the um, proposed addition. Um, and then to the south of that, the part of the building, the majority of the building, which would be within the 10 meter height limit. This is the plan that was submitted by um, the applicants. It's a markup of the approved site plan. Um, showing the proposed building addition. So again, outlined in red is the location of the proposed expansion. Um, the total floor area would be 3,707 square meters or about um, 40,000 square feet. And so that would bring the total size of that building with the addition to about 80,000 square feet. Um, in addition to that, there is an existing large building, as mentioned, the main building um, is about 189,000 square feet. Um, notwithstanding all those large buildings uh, existing and proposed, the um, site is well within the maximum coverage requirements. Um, this plan just again denotes the area where the increased height is proposed. Um, one thing we would note is that the addition and the increased height um, of the building are further away from the nearest residential area, which is located to the southeast um, in the township of Amaranth um, and is closer to the other property being developed by Ice River Springs for water bottling and the industrial area. So to that point, um, Obviously, there was a concern raised as per the correspondence attached to my report about the noise and the visual impact of the increased height for the portion of the proposed building addition. Um, the noise relates to the existing um, noise generated by the operations. Um, so we've plotted out the setbacks to the nearest residential lot, um, which is located to the southeast and the existing southwest corner of the building where the addition would start is about 380 meters from that closest rear um, part of that property to the southeast and the tall, the tall part of the building that is subject to the variance request is about 435 meters away. Um, however, we do want to see some more information so some conditions are recommended. Um, an amendment to the site plan is required anyway, um, not only to show this building area, but also to um, identify any related site improvements, um, parking, stormwater management. The county has requested and town engineering requires a stormwater management plan as part of that site plan amendment application. Um, again, that will just make sure that all the drainage from the expanded building area will be handled on site within the stormwater facilities. Um, and we would also recommend that the site plan amendment application include the submission of a noise assessment. Um, we received a letter today from the noise consultants working with um, the applicant and they noted that there is a minor increase in truck traffic uh, anticipated as a result of the addition. Um, the addition would primarily be for additional warehouse and storage space. Um, 
it is not about more process equipment, uh, but that does generate a little bit more truck traffic. They indicated that they don't expect any noise impacts as a result of that small increase in the truck volume to the site. Um, I think it was three trucks on average per day would be the increased traffic. Um, and as part of their certificate of compliance with the Ministry of Environment, um, they are required to keep and maintain a noise uh, assessment that indicates that they're operating within the sound level limits of the ministry. So as part of the site plan amendment, we will get a copy of that noise assessment that's underway. Um, and it will, we will ask that it demonstrate two things as the ministry requires. One, that the existing operations are within sound level limits at the nearest residential properties. And secondly, that the addition will not cause that to change. Um, the application was circulated and a copy of, uh, or sorry, a summary of the comments received is provided in my report. Um, there was a comment from the county inquiring about whether an environmental impact study should be required because there is some environmental features in Fiddle Park to the east. Um, however, this is further away from any prior development on the site. So, we don't anticipate any environmental impacts to those features as a result of this uh, building addition. There was no EIS required as part of the previous um, building work on the site. And it, it's, it's you know, obviously across the road from those features. Um, the other comment from the county was about source water protection. Um, in fact, the site is outside of the wellhead protection area and that comment relates to some outdated mapping that the, that the county was referencing. Um, County Public Works, as I mentioned, does want a stormwater management report to demonstrate no impacts to the county right-of-way and their, their existing drainage ditch. So we will require that as part of the site plan amendment. And then, as mentioned, there was the comment from Christelle uh, Krupa at 2 Devonley Drive. Um, again, citing some concerns about existing noise from the existing operations and whether the addition will increase that noise. Um, and also just some concerns about the overall height, uh, the, the visible, visual impact of the height of the building. Um, so we are here tonight to hear uh, from either the applicant and any members of the public who have any comments or concerns. I believe the applicant is on the Zoom call. Um, and one point of clarification, I made reference in my report um, that the, um, that the, increased height was related to additional industrial equipment. In fact, the applicant has since clarified that it's more about maintaining the structure and uh, for structural reasons, uh, keeping that same profile as the existing building. So in order to have that addition work properly from a structural standpoint, they have to maintain that height. Um, so it is not about additional industrial equipment that requires that height. Um, so I've provided some analysis in our report about the tests for a minor variance. Um, likewise, the applicants planner, Christine Loft, has submitted a letter also evaluating those tests. We've both reached the conclusion that it meets the test for a minor variance, um, but that conclusion is also subject to any comments we've received from the committee and members of the public tonight. So on that, um, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, for the public question period and for any questions from the committee. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Any questions from committee members? Deputy Mayor Anderson. Yeah, um, Steve, uh, or, or maybe one of the representatives could uh, answer this question. Uh, the Obviously, the noise is one of the major concerns, and the increase in truck traffic uh, certainly will enhance that. How reasonably certain are the representatives that the increase in truck traffic is just going to be uh, roughly about uh, three additional trucks per day. Um, and if for some reason this were to be approved down the road and the truck traffic uh, actually increased, uh, let's say substantially beyond that, what remedy would we have under those circumstances? Um, I don't think we would have much. And I don't know that the truck noise is really a source of concern from a, from a planning perspective because this is a signed and designated truck route. Um, on County Road 11. Um, so there could be an increase in truck traffic just by virtue of 
you know, continued background growth in, in through truck traffic. And in fact, the, the existing truck route has also been looked at as potential routing for truck bypass. So actually the, the noise concern for the prior application when this building was built in 2017 and, and for the current application was, was really just related to um, the operating equipment in the building itself. And we did get a noise study as part of the previous submission. It demonstrated and showed the noise contours that it meets the ministry requirements, but obviously they weren't up and operating yet at that point because they hadn't built the building. So we want to make sure that the operations are in fact within what was expected when that study was done in 2017. Um, the, the, the increased truck volume, uh, you know, if, if it's three additional trucks or if that grows to five or even 10, it's a pretty minor increase in the volume of truck traffic on that roadway. Um, and the noise consultant is simply indicating that, um, you know, it, it wouldn't be a noticeable noise increase from the existing volumes only related to this industry. Um, I think if you factor in the total truck volume on that road, you know, three to 10 or, you, you know, any more uh, than that is a pretty minor increase. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from committee members? I, I see that uh, Christine Loft from Loft Planning is, is on the line on behalf of the uh, the applicant. Christine, is there anything else you would like to add or share? Um, thank you. Good evening. Um, I think I'll just uh, confirm um, with Steve's point about there being no additional equipment in this portion. It is for warehousing, um, warehousing of resin and of film rolls. So there's no... Um, it's not expected that there would be the additional equipment in um, the portion, the rear portion of the building that has the additional height and that it is for structural purposes, that the height needs to remain at, at that 22.5 meters um, to match the, the basically the mirror image of the existing um, second building uh, as labeled on Steve's presentation. Um, there was of course additional parking required, but the site already had more parking than what was originally required. So there's some shifting on the site plan of the existing parking, um, but very few additional spaces were required. Um, Steve's indicated about the, the letter that we obtained from the noise expert, and he really identified that it was the, the three um, additional truck traffic movements per day that would be the additional, um, or would show any difference in noise and um, the, of course, the approval is conditional on a full noise report. And just to member Anderson's question or comment, um, the noise assessment is also required for the EA compliance process. So there would be an ongoing um, um, review of noise even once the operation is up and running. So I think that you know, provides a bit more response um, to your question. The comments from the County Public Works Department on stormwater, I have forwarded those comments to Jeff Ake at, at Tatham's. Um, they were just finalizing their stormwater report. So they will take a look at the County Road comments um, and uh, respond with any, anything that's required based on those County comments. And um, lastly, um, I spoke to the um, GOTS this morning and they would expect there would be an additional four to eight um, positions that they would hire um, based on this warehousing component because ultimately it means that the that the current operation is going to be able to run at full capacity um, with the additional warehousing so there will be some additional positions um, with this expansion and those are my comments thank you any additional questions Okay, so, so the planner has recommended that, uh, that we approve the minor variance uh, with conditions. So the, the draft resolution reads, be it resolved that the Committee of Adjustment receives report P2020-07 for information and that subject to the consideration of any input received at the public meeting, it is recommended that the Committee of Adjustment grant approval of minor variance application A20-02 for the property municipally known as 485387 side road 30 and legally described as concession two, part lot 31, and further designated as part one on reference plan 7T4664 in the town of Shelburne, County of Dufferin, 
to permit relief from the required height of 10 meters to 22.5 meters limited to a building area of 520 square meters subject to the following conditions. Number one, that the owner shall obtain approval of a site plan amendment from the town of Shelburne for the proposed development of the additional building area on the subject property and related site improvements. Number two, that the owner's application for a site plan amendment shall include the submission of a stormwater management report to the satisfaction of the town and county of Dufferin, and that the owner shall agree to implement the recommendations of the report. And three, that the owner's application for a site plan amendment shall include the submission of a noise assessment report that demonstrates that the sound levels from the industrial operations within the existing and expanded building are and will remain within the sound level limits of the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Environmental Noise Guideline NPC-300 at all sensitive receptors. The mover and seconder for that, moved by Member Bonato, seconded by Member Hall. Any discussion on that? All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried as well. Thank you. All right. Anything else, Steve? No. Okay. No, Mr. Chair. I think that's it. Um, thank you. Uh, I think that's it for the committee of adjustment. And uh, I'll be back for, I think, some later reports. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. So with that, I'll look for a motion to adjourn the committee of adjustment meeting. Moved by Member Bonato, seconded by Member Fegan. All in favor? That's carried. All right, so I will now call the regular council meeting for July 13th to order. Uh, in consideration of the current COVID-19 provincial and public health orders prohibiting public gatherings of more than 10 people and requirements for physical distancing between persons, in-person attendance at tonight's regular council meeting will not be permitted. Members of the public can access a copy of the agenda and draft minutes from the Town of Shelburne website at shelburne.ca or watch the council meeting video from the town's YouTube channel. Correspondence related to the agenda business may be submitted by email to the clerk at jwillaby at shelburne.ca. Uh, are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest from any member of council? I don't see any. So with that, I look for a mover and seconder to adopt the minutes from the regular council meeting held June 22nd, 2020. Moved by Deputy Mayor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Buffett. Any discussion on the minutes? All in favor? It's carried, thank you. Uh, public question period. So the way that question period is operating right now is questions are to be submitted to uh, the clerk via email or telephone. I don't believe we have any for tonight, uh, but there were some public questions uh, which were submitted, um, directed towards council uh, as part of the OPP presentation. So I've asked the clerk to read those tonight and we can address those. So we had a question from Elizabeth Tozer, 192 Berry Street. How much more will our income taxes go up in the third and fourth quarter of 2020 since the Shelburne Council has six months to pay 3.2 million plus pay severance packages to 21 Shelburne police officers. Okay, I, I'm assuming she means property taxes. Um, and, and I guess the short answer is there, there would be no effect on the, the third and fourth quarter for 2020. Um, re regardless of what decision council makes, it, it sounds as though from the OPP that the earliest possible transition date, which would be the same date of, of any potential disbandment of Shelburne Police Service would be in February of 2021. Um, if the CAO or the treasurer would like to add anything, I can yield the floor to them. Denise? That's correct, Mayor. The, expect, the date was confirmed by the OPP. It's stated in the staff report that's now being deferred to Wednesday night that the expected transition date would be February 21st, 2021. All right, second question. Okay, next question is Len Gushardi, 141 Main Street West in Shelburne. 
There should be nothing more important in a community than community safety. Having said that, we know the Shelburne Police Service costs moving forward and the excellent service they provide. However, we do not have a cost for the OPP after the three transition period, nor will they provide it. We also do not know if in the end, Shelburne will be happy with the OPP policing model. I cite the Leamington example. So my question to each member of council is, in light of the current environment, is this really a time to risk community safety? With the current police public perception and with additional emphasis on community-based policing, why does council, why does council, this is it still in the community's best interest to outsource our need to the OPP? Okay. I, I, I think I have the gist of it. Um, so, so I guess, first of all, you know, the, the, the indication that the OPP didn't provide costing numbers beyond the, the transitional contract. Um, those are part of the projections that are included in the staff report that are, are part of tonight's agenda, but will be deferred to Wednesday evening for discussion. Um, and, and those are based on the, the billing model that is available to everybody. Um, in, in terms of risking public safety, I think that was the, 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 the suggestion there. Um, I, I, I've actually talked to Len Gishardi about this a few times and, and I mean, quite frankly, I'm, I'm not sure of any community that's policed by OPP that, um, you know, feels as though they're, they're posed with a, with a risk to public safety. Uh, I mean, most neighboring municipalities uh, now uh, are, are policed by, by OPP, Shelburne, uh, Orangeville will be, um, sorry, not Shelburne, Alliston, or Orangeville will be in the fall. Um, I mean, from a public safety point of view, I certainly don't think twice about uh, getting out of my car and walking down the street in the town of Alliston or the town of New Tecumseh. Um, to be honest, I, I just think it's, it's an unfounded fear. Um, but, you know, that's obviously part of, part of the equation. I, I think the Leamington example, um, Mr. Gishardi actually asked that question of the OPP last week and, and they addressed that so um, th the question was posed to each member of council so does anybody else want to add anything to that okay okay next question is from uh, len mikulich 105 carolyn street if the transition costs are well over one million dollars then why not put those funds towards a new police facility along with the development charges money and the current police reserves, which you already have. Okay. Um, I, I guess, first of all, we, we don't know what the transition costs will be in, in, in entirely. Um, we're, we're actually in the middle of contract negotiations between the police services board and the, uh, and the police association. Um, in, in terms of, I, I guess his suggestion is that whatever money would be spent on transition costs could be spent on, on building costs instead. To be honest, I mean that that sort of yesterday's discussion that that was that was the discussion that that formed the basis of, of the costing process that was concluded last July. It, it dealt with with accommodations almost exclusively, um, and this very same council at, at that point in July of 2019, uh, you know, did come up with a, a solution to the accommodation issue um, that that you know, albeit not perfect, I, I think was what was at least satisfactory. The issue is, and as I've said a number of times, the reason we're back involved in, a, in another costing is that we're not only dealing with an accommodation issue anymore. Um, it, it's now turned into an accommodation issue, plus a supervision issue, uh, plus a dispatch issue, uh, plus just quite frankly, a, a sustainability issue of, of the organization going forward. Um, so so I, I think it's, it's a little overly simplistic in, in terms of its analysis to suggest that we simply would, would swap out any potential transition costs for the cost of a new building. The, the issues that we're confronted with as a council now are, are far bigger than just simply the accommodation issues. Um, Carrie or, or Treasurer, I don't know if you want to add anything on that. Thank you. I think you covered it, uh, Mr. Mayor, and it and it does come down to sustainability. Even after, if we if we put all that money towards a new building, 
and took on the added debt, um, it, it's still, it's a, a sustainability issue going forward for many years to come. Is that it, Jennifer? Oh, Denise? Uh, through the mayor, the report again, I know is being deferred, but it does provide the analysis that you can compare those kinds of scenarios that what are the 10 year cumulative savings with one services versus the other. So that that's a critical evaluation criteria financially and to reinforce what the treasurer just said, it's about affordability and sustainability in terms of the data that we, we completed the analysis on. That's everything for public questions. And, and there were no other questions submitted today, right? That's correct. All right. Okay, so we have two presentations this evening. The first is from Alethea O'Hara Stevenson regarding the Dufferin uh, County Canadian Black Association. So I see Alethea is online. Uh, are you going to share a video, Alethea? Or... Oh, there we go. You're up. Perfect. Hello, everyone. I will share my screen with you. Perfect. So thank you, everyone, for allowing me to present tonight. Hello, Mayor Mills, Deputy Mayor Anderson, Council members, staff, and special guests. As many of you may already know, my name is Alethea St O'Hara Stevenson, and I've had the profound honor of leading and partnering on a number of initiatives in Dufferin County that has contributed, contributed to and en en enhanced the well being of individuals in the community. Most notably, leading the Youth Advisory Committee at Centre Dufferin District High School, a number of Black History Month events um, and initiatives in the counties, um, in particular the Museum of Dufferin, the town of Shelburne. Um, and decaf, just to name a few. And I've also been able to participate in a number of other community initiatives um, that contributes to the well being of the community. Uh, for example, the Hills of Headwaters Community Wellness Council. Involvement in these activities and community events have allowed me to have a broad view and perspective of not just the demographic of Dufferin County, but also the growing needs of the community. As you are fully aware, uh, the world has changed significantly over the past several months and the way we live and work have changed and will continue to change. And there is no doubt that we're all impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and the tragic events that have unfolded across the globe. Um, and we recently had the chance to participate in the Black Lives um, Matter movement that took place both here in Shelburne as well as in Orangeville. Some individuals um, also attended that event there. Um, as a result of all these initiatives, it is now clearer than ever the blaring need to have the tools and supports in place to address the needs of the Black community to ensure that together we can continue to thrive and make Dufferin County one of the best and most desirable places to live for everyone. As such, I am honored and humbled to share with you today the Dufferin County Canadian Black Association. So just to give you a history of uh, the association, a number of individuals in the community have had discussions on how we can collectively serve the needs of the Black community and ensure that um, these needs are addressed and represented at all levels, such as board membership, uh, local government, um, in the community as a whole. So as a result, uh, the idea was essentially to form an organization that will represent the needs of the diverse Black community um, at all levels in Dufferin County nations. The second part to this presentation is to talk about a diversity and inclusion or equity committee um, to ensure accountability, access and equity across Dufferin County um, and specifically for the town of Shelburne. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, this presentation was also delivered at the um, Dufferin County um, meeting and was well received. Um, the idea is to share this um, presentation with the town of Shelburne and to replicate some of the um, the ideas that have presented there and to have them implemented with the town of Shelburne. 
from a statistical perspective, um, we know that this is based on the 2016 um, stats. And we know that the demographics of Dufferin County and Shelburne has changed significantly, but just going off um, what we have uh, data to support, um, based on the 2016 statistics, uh, Black Canadians make up roughly 3% of the Dufferin County population. When you look at Shelburne, Shelburne has the highest number, which is 9.5% of, at the time, the posted 7,875 um, population. And of course, we know that those numbers are fairly outdated. Um, if we look at Orangeville, Orangeville represents 2%. But again, just focusing on the town of Shelburne, uh, those numbers are quite significant. And of course, Black Canadians make up, or I should say Black Shelburneites, uh, make up the largest population of minority in, in the community. So what does this mean? So when we look at the objective of the Dufferin County Canadian Black Association, it is essentially to provide leadership for the continued development and enhancement of the Black community through civic engagement, education, programs and services, and to advocate for equity and well-being for the Black community um, in the town of Shelburne. It is also to be a central hub for resources, tools, and programs that are unique to the needs of the Black community in Dufferin County. And a perfect example of this is uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we don't have any data that supports you know, how, how this virus has impacted the Black community specifically. Um, we know that there are significant impacts, but we don't have anything that is quantifiable that we can actually um, trace back to and gather any sufficient data. So one of the ideas would be to have a central hub where we can gather this information and put it to good use with the various uh, departments um, that can help us support the needs of the community. The vision of the organization is to develop and foster a socially equ economically equitable group that will continue to contribute to the growth and development in Dufferin County in Canada, to have a strong focus on youth achievement and excellence, and to partner again with all uh, government officials, all levels, local businesses, corporations, existing nonprofit organizations, um, specifically to support the issues and needs of the Black community. Uh, we've got values uh, that centers around advocacy, excellence, education, and integrity. And for those of you who know me, you know, I am very, a very strong supporter of um, youth excellence and education. And so it, you know, makes natural sense that, you know, part of this organization has a heavy focus on youth achievement and excellence as well. For the second piece of the um, presentation, uh, we're talking about the diversity and inclusion or equity committee, or maybe we can just title it diversity, equity and inclusion committee. And the idea of this committee again is to ensure accountability, access and equity across, um, when we initially presented was at the Dufferin County level, but now that we're talking to the town of Shelburne uh, specifically um, to ensure equity across um, the town of Shelburne. And ensures that the town and um, various organizations are open and flexible to new and relevant information as it respects to employees, promote inclusivity in our community. And um, we have already established the anti-Black racism, anti-racism and uh, discrimination task force. Um, the task force is a point in time. So the idea would be for a diversity, inclusion and equity committee to um, pick up where that is, has essentially left off and carry on um, the work that was already started. Um, the idea for this diversity, inclusion and equity committee would also be to develop and foster a collaborative environment that reduces or eliminates the disparity outcomes for mi minorities, marginalized communities in Dufferin County when it comes to education, health, access and justice. Um, and of course, the core values are around respect and dignity, diversity, integrity and education. Um, the outcomes of this would be to have this adopted as part of the town's strategic priorities going forward. It's not a committee that is going to be disbanded at a certain point. It would be something that we can carry on um, for years to come. In terms of next steps. So what we're hoping to achieve is partnership. So when we look at Dufferin County Canadian Black Association, 
what we're looking for is partnership with a town of Shelburne and that partnership could take up various forms. It could be um, in kind a donation, it could be funding, um, resources, you know, we're open to um, whatever information is available um, for us in terms of partnership. Um, we talk about branding as, you know, one of the key things is to show the strong representation and partnership between the town of Shelburne and um, DCCBA to elevate the status of um, Black Canadians or Black, um, the supports that we need so that we can continue to thrive. From the Diversity and Inclusion, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee. Um, again, it's a new committee, committee uh, that should be established in the town of Shelburne. And um, as I am presenting this, I am fully aware that there may already be existing committees that um, we could possibly leverage. So that is something that I would be open to. Um, but again, the idea would be to embed this as part of uh, the town's strategic priorities um, long-term. So I mentioned earlier that we would be looking for funding for the Dufferin County Canadian um, Black Association. This is just a quick um, three-year outline of what uh, funding would look like. So year one is initially startup costs, branding, advertising, campaign, um, awareness and education around anti-Black racism. Year two would be continued awareness and, and, um, and education, youth development and achievement programs. Um, we talk about yeah, Finlet, you know, I know the schools are already um, implementing it as part of their curriculum, but the idea would be to enhance on some of those programs to make sure that our youth are set up for success, internship opportunities, uh, mental health forums, and going on to year three, um, scholarship opportunities, again, internship oper opportunities for our youth, um, Finlay's coding, um, the long list goes on. So initially, this is just the initial plan to get us off the ground. Um, once we have our full committee established, we will be able to um, develop a more robust structure um, for year three and beyond. And perhaps we can enhance um, what we already outlined for years one to three. Um, the team right now um, consists of myself and since the initial presentation was made to Dufferin County, I am pleased and excited to share that we have onboarded two additional board members, uh, Linda Grant, who is well known in the community for her financial work, as well as Dear Harvey, who has been instrumental in um, the community as well on various um, boards, as well as the, he's currently a member of the task, Anti-Black Racism Task Force. Um, with the town of Shelburne and is also very involved with the school at Centre Dufferin. The other success story that um, I'd like to share is since we've made the presentation at, the, at Dufferin County, we have already received um, funding from a number of individuals and uh, we already have a scholarship lined up, which is the Bill Hill Scholarship um, that will be geared towards um, a Black student um, in the community. And um, another, as a result, another scholarship will be um, available to an Indigenous student as well. So we've made um, some tremendous uh, steps so far and um, I look forward to all the other great things that um, is set to come. In terms of funding, so we are looking at funding from all levels of government and um, my partner Gear Harvey has already started to do some work in completing grant applications. Um, and I know the province of Ontario in particular recently launched um, a program that will be geared towards um, enhancing the black community. Of course, we would be looking for support from the town of Shelburne and I'm aware that um, grant applications, I believe start sometime in August. So I will definitely be um, reaching out for support um, at that time as well. Um, on this slide is just a rough outline of the kind of funding that we're looking for and um, the percentage breakdown um, where we possibly think that um, we could get funding and uh, the allocation. And essentially that is the presentation in a nutshell. So thank you very much for your time and does anyone have any questions? Just wait until we get back to the full screen here. All right, are there any questions for Alethea? 
Councillor Wagner. Hey there. Um, just wanted to say uh, it's a wonderful initiative and uh, I fully support you and, and uh, those of you uh, that are helping you. Um, just a quick question though, is it a Shelburne sort of initiative only or will you also be um, reaching out to like Melanchthon, um, you know, our surrounding communities, uh, Amherst, places like that to help with funding? I will definitely be reaching out to other communities for funding. Um, it is Dufferin County wide. Okay, awesome, and thank you. I'd also like to add that though this is um, a program specifically designed to cater to the needs of the black community, uh, I'm fully aware that there are many students who could potentially um, take advantage of the program who don't identify as black. So we wouldn't be turning away any student because they don't identify as black or anyone for that matter that don't identify as black. But it's important that the need um, of the, the black community was addressed and that's why it was focused around black Canadians. Fantastic. Okay. Anybody else? Deputy Mayor Anderson? Yeah, thanks, uh, Mayor Mills, for the opportunity. Uh, Alethea, thanks again for another fantastic presentation. Um, uh, I really um, agree and obviously support the recommendation with respect to the uh, diversity and inclusion committee being established. Obviously, that's a discussion for down the road. Uh, it was that recommendation that uh, was made by Alethea at the county table that actually led to the establishment of the uh, diversity and inclusion committee uh, at the county level. So I thank you for, for that initiative. Um, this is important. Uh, you heard Alethea make reference to the data since 2016. I think it's fair to say that uh, those numbers have grown exponentially. Uh, I think we just have to look around and see that's the case. Uh, uh, the mayor was just uh, downtown on Main Street opening up another black business. And so an organization like this gives um, uh, it's a central place sort of where people could go to and identify with and feel that their needs are being supported and represented. Um, personally, I'm also excited about this because it really takes, uh, I think a lot of uh, weight off of my shoulders and maybe even Alethea's as well, because without a central place, there are people who genuinely want to help and uh, are reaching out and, and they're wondering, where could I go? <clears throat> where could I go? Who could I speak to? And to have an organization like this is very important because otherwise what often happens is my phone is ringing off the hook. Uh, hey, Steve, how can I get involved? Where could I go? What could I do? And I don't mind fielding those kinds of questions, but I think an organization like this with the team that you have identified will certainly assist a, a long way, uh, again, having that central hub in that space. And I'm also happy to hear, as you said, that look, nobody's going to be turned away. Uh, and that uh, even though you are bringing attention to a particular group, that it's still inclusive, especially as it pertains to volunteers and those who want to assist and to support the cause. So I, once again, I just want to say thanks for the presentation and the work that you're doing. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Anderson. To add to your comment, um, with the recent um, store that opened up in town, this would be the perfect spot where you know we would be able to showcase the local businesses and especially black businesses that are often um, unheard of or um, they're opening and we not no one is aware of who they are, where they are, and, and what services they provide. So this would be another um, great place for them to be able to showcase it and. Um, Get the support that they need, whether it's traffic and customers, etc. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Well, th thank you very much, Alethea. Um, as as already mentioned, I mean that this is important work, and I, I certainly appreciate uh, you stepping up to to be the champion and, and lead the charge on this. Um, you you already touched on this right at the end of your presentation, but I was going to suggest that in terms of funding. That uh, that you uh, you know do avail yourself of our community grant funding program, and, and I do think actually that uh, those applications are are going to be sent out maybe as early as tomorrow. Um, so uh, it's probably safe to assume that we should include you on on that list. So if, if our treasurer can can make sure that Alethea gets a, a copy of that application, that would be great. Uh, so with that, I would look for a mover and a seconder to receive the presentation regarding the Dufferin County Canadian Black Association. Moved by Councillor Hall, seconded by Councillor Buffett. Any further discussion on that? 
All in favor? It's carried. Thanks very much, Alethea. Thank you. Have a great evening. You too. Okay, and our second presentation is uh, from Katarzyna Sliwa from Denton's Canada on behalf of Plato Developments, Inc. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Thank you. My name is Katarina Sliba. I am counsel for Flato Developments, Inc. Thank you for allowing us or allowing me to make this deputation tonight. Uh, we also want to thank staff and the town's consultants and all of the hard work that's been going into the planning matters uh, for the, the town, including uh, with respect to the assimilative capacity study and related environmental assessment and its advancement with the ministry. As you know, Flato owns approximately 100 acres on the west side of the town of Shelburne, immediately adjacent to the western boundary of the existing town of Shelburne settlement area. The lands are triangular in shape and are generally located in the northeast quadrant of the fourth line and Highway 89 intersection, um, as shown in the aerial that was attached to my letter dated June 19th, 2020. Flato has been working with the town of Shelburne for some time now on a proposed development application for the lands for up to 1,750 people and 33 jobs uh, over time, uh, which includes 250 to 310 single detached dwellings, 114 to 123 townhomes, 93 seniors apartment units, 1,840 square meters of commercial gross floor area, three parks totaling over 1.4 hectares and over 10 hectares of protected natural features. The lands are identified for future growth, as you know, uh, by policy 3.5.1.2 of the Dufferin County official plan, which identifies these lands as an area for the expansion of the urban settlement area pending confirmation of servicing capacity. The policies of the town of Shelburne official plan amendments 34 and 36 consider the lands for growth as well and propose that the lands be brought into the settlement area boundary, although these policies are not yet in effect. We are making the submission ahead of the staff report that is included in tonight's agenda from Mr. Steve Weaver on the planning and development update. But as you know, Growth Plan Amendment 1 was released by the province on June 16, 2020. The county's MCR will need to conform with these new policies, including the new planning horizon to 2051, Schedule 3 forecasts, and the land needs assessment, all of which allow for more growth in Dufferin County. The Flato lands are an ideal location to accommodate this growth and for the expansion of the settlement area boundary given their location adjacent to the existing settlement area in the town of Shelburne and the town's policies, which already signal the intention to expand into this area. The proposed development would promote cost-effective and efficient development patterns, thereby minimizing servicing costs and avoiding areas of environmental concern. With respect to servicing in particular, from the Espernet and Associates presentation received by the town of Shelburne Council, on June 22nd, 2020, we understand that the existing water and wastewater infrastructure is required to be updated. We also understand that additional infrastructure is proposed to accommodate projected growth in the town, including the accommodation of servicing to the Flato lands. Uh, based on the Espernet report regarding allocations prepared for the meeting today, we understand that it, there is not enough capacity to service all of the reserve or uncommitted developments in the existing urban boundary. We further understand that if the existing water and wastewater infrastructure is not completed, the financial burden of future capital projects and necessary infrastructure improvements may fall on the existing residents in the form of property tax increases in the future. Flato has not only supported that this work be completed, um, it has stated publicly that it is willing to upfront a portion of its development charges for the proposed development in order to move this important infrastructure forward uh, in a quick or timely manner. It is expected that if this infrastructure work doesn't happen, it will increase existing servicing problems as there are odor issues that need to be addressed. We understand that the town's sewage infiltration improvements 
and rehabilitation work to reduce infiltration has helped to increase available sewage capacity but has also increased the odor at the water pollution control plant lagoons as a result of a lower concentration of water being directed to the plant. Again, Flato is willing to upfront the associated costs of servicing for its lands, including entering into any appropriate agreements with the town. Uh, we participated in the county council meeting last week during which WSP pr uh, presented um, a, a, an update with respect to the municipal comprehensive review that is underway at the county. Uh, we want to ensure that the work being carried out um, at the county level is informed by the S. Burnett and Associates water and wastewater environmental assessments. We also ask that this work is shared with the province and informs the province's consultation process for Amendment 1. Um, I'm going to turn to transportation for just a brief moment. Uh, we understand and respect that the municipal comprehensive review process is underway at the county level. However, as outlined in Mr. Steve, Mr. Weaver's report, the transportation study could commence and we respectfully ask that council direct that staff proceed with the transportation study and initiate the EA and the terms of reference associated with it. Flato would like to proceed with bringing the purpose-built seniors rental units to market as soon as possible, as there is a significant need today as we all know from the media coverage. We would like to proceed as soon as possible, but if the town prefers to wait for the municipal comprehensive review to be concluded, we're in your hands. Uh, with respect to growth, uh, again, just briefly, Mr. Weaver's report indicates that consideration for a settlement area boundary expansion within the town's boundary will be part of the county's municipal comprehensive review process. Although we do note that there are policies in the growth plan that were added that permit limited expansions outside of that MCR process. Um, our question would be uh, to the town's consultants as to whether the town will be requesting that the county as part of the MCR process include all of the lands within the town boundary within the settlement area, given that the town has assumed this growth and built a future build out of the town in the water and wastewater EAs. In closing, we look forward to continuing to work with the town staff, council and consultants, and we request again that the Flato lands be considered for inclusion in the town of Shelburne settlement area. Again, we're in council's hands about when you would like us to come forward with the development applications, uh, because as you know, uh, our client is ready to file those applications. All of the work has been done, all of the requisite studies and reports have been prepared and we are ready, willing and able to proceed. Um, our client Shakir Ramatula was to join me for the deputation today, but I don't uh, see him on the line. Uh, he also had with him Ms. Emma West and Mr. Nick Caracas, our client's planner and engineer uh, respectively. Uh, we'd be happy to respond to any questions from council or provide additional information. We again note that the planning report and update for Mr. Weaver is on later in the agenda, and we'd be happy to stay on in order to answer any questions. Thank you for your time, and again, thank you for the opportunity to make the submission. Thank you for, uh, for the presentation. Um, you're right that there, there are some reports later on the, in the agenda, which will we'll touch on some of this, um, and, and I suspect that uh, that our, our planner will likely provide a, a response to you in writing uh, to, to your letter. Um, but Steve is on the line. I, I don't know if Steve wants to add anything tonight uh, outside of, of the reports. I think uh, to the question, and, and thank you for that uh, presentation, um, to the question about um, will all of the land, uh, will the town be requesting that all of the land in the municipal boundary um, be added to the urban boundary. Uh, that is yes, um, we, we've been requesting that for, for quite some time and, and we've been feeding the information coming out of the environmental assessments that um, Espernet Associates is working on to the county uh, to make sure that they consider that information as part of the MCR. Okay. Yeah. Councilor Bernardo. Sorry, how is it? Um, you mentioned there were three requests that you would like to do. One was transportation, and I 
sort of got lost in the other two. Can you re repeat that part again for me? Yes, thank you, Councillor Bonato. Through you, um, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd referenced three separate areas. Uh, that's correct. With respect to the servicing work uh, that is being carried out by the town's consultant, uh, we're, we're asking that uh, the town and the consultants ensure that that work is being provided to the county and then in turn by the county to the province um, and feeding into both the municipal comprehensive review and the county's consultation with respect to growth plan amendment one. Um, I noted at the uh, county council meeting uh, last week that the county's consultants WSP did um, note that there were um, references in the province's material to environmental constraints uh, on servicing. And we just want to ensure that the most up-to-date information is used uh, at times uh, for various reasons. That's not always the case. And I know, I know that from my planning experience, planning law experience, that's sometimes a struggle between the levels of government that are involved in our planning process. Um, with respect to the transportation, um, our client is requesting that uh, the transportation studies uh, with respect to um, transportation um, through and adjoining the lands and the EAs uh, in that uh, part of this proposed future settlement area uh, commence and the terms of reference uh, uh, start to be framed. Um, and then lastly, uh, with respect to uh, the growth piece, we had uh, the question that was posed through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Weaver, and I do appreciate the clarification and, and the response there. Um, I think the uh, other question with respect to growth would be, um, when would council uh, like to see the development applications filed? Uh, we've been at this for quite some time. And as I said, the reports and studies are ready. Our clients consultants are, are prepared at, at your um, call uh, to meet with uh, the town's consultants and proceed. Sorry, if I could do a follow up to staff, can, or to Steve or to whoever, can we start the transportation studies? Is there any reason we can't start them? Um, we have looked at creating the terms of reference and, and have started that. Um, there's been a couple of challenges with finalizing that. Um, the first is the county through their MCR process will be doing a countywide transportation assessment. And the original work plan had that, you know, terms of reference and that study well underway by now. Um, but as a result of the province issuing a new growth plan amendment, new forecasts, all of which um, factors into these transportation analyses and forecasts, um, they've indicated in their recent update to county council that they can't start their transportation work at the county level um, until this amendment one is finalized and they, they uh, have the land needs methodology sorted out to work with. The other issue was, um, and, and one of the fundamental issues for the transportation master plan is, is the bypass consideration. And those discussions have been ongoing uh, with MTO and with the county. And um, we wanted to make sure that we had a good sort of pre-consultation with all of those agencies and fleshed out some options, some issues before we go too far into creating the terms of reference so that we don't send whoever the consultant is doing the transportation master plan on a kind of false errand. Um, we want to make sure that it, the terms of reference is fully informed by that. So um, I suppose if there's a third issue, it's it's really um, resources. I mean, there, there are a lot of active developments. There's highway improvements that are underway. There's grant applications that the town's engineers have, have been making or, or sorry, connecting link funding applications for more urgent issues, the longer term planning has, has somewhat had to uh, go to the back burner during the, the COVID situation. But um, that is on our radar and we'd like to come forward certainly uh, in the second half of this year with the terms of reference and get this TMP, this transportation master plan underway. Okay. okay. Any other questions or comments from members of council? Mr. Mayor, if, if I may, just as a point of um, maybe clarification or to my um, last request, if it would be possible 
for our clients, transportation planner and planner to have some discussions with staff with respect to the transportation uh, piece, the terms of reference, but also the bypass. I, I'm not certain if there's um, clarity around um, what MTO's expectation for the bypass is. Um, I think it would be extremely helpful to our client. Again, uh, the community in part is uh, seniors um, affordable rental and that's the, the focus for our client in order to have that part of the project come online in a timely way. I think it would be extremely helpful to have some collaboration, additional collaboration with staff. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm fully on board with uh, collaboration with, with Flato's consultants. We've had some conversations with Cole Engineering and, and with Leah Consulting. Um, I believe both of those are working with um, Flato. Um, and um, the challenge with the bypass issue is, is well, it, it partly relates to Main Street, obviously, because that's the current truck route. But there has been, obviously, some discussion and preliminary thought to fourth line. Um, we know that fourth line is, is not a, a road that is up to standard to allow truck traffic right now and it's not to an urban standard and that it's a shared road with the adjoining township. So um, we wanted to have some of those initial conversations and have had them with, with MTO. Um, I think that's probably gone as far as it can go at this stage without having some technical analysis. So um, I think we're on the same page uh, with Flato's team in terms of where we need to go next uh, you know, to, to start this TMP process. Okay. All right. Can I have a motion to receive the presentation? Councillor Bonato, seconded by Councillor Buffett. Any further discussion? All in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much. Okay. And and by all means, stick around for the for the remaining reports. We will, thank you. All right, uh, before we get into uh, regular agenda items, are there any council inquiries for this evening? Councillor Wagner. Um, just a, a couple of small ones. Um, with the um, notification, I guess, or, or whatnot from the government that we will be heading into stage three, um, or phase three, whatever you want to call it. Uh, just wondering if the town of Shelburne is looking at potentially following suit with allowing playgrounds to be open. Good question. Um, we have our emergency control group meeting uh, scheduled for tomorrow at 11. Um, I think that'll probably be one, one of the first items to, uh, to discuss. Um, I, I know that our CAO will, will speak to sort of the, the announcement today with respect to, to phase three uh, within the context of, of her report that's coming later um, in, in terms of, of plans for reopening town hall. Um, so, you know, the, the one thing that our, our blueprint did talk about in, in terms of reopening was obviously, you know, we'll, we'll be directed by provincial and public health recommendations and directives, but, but also sort of viewing those things through the, the lens of local needs as well. Um, it, and, you know, local capacity to, to be able to manage things effectively. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that as a group tomorrow. I mean, from my part, one of one of the questions that I would have for our, our public works team is, you know, th their ability to, to sort of manage playgrounds and, and, you know, wh whether there are protocols that, that need to be put in place for regular sanitization and, and all of that sort of stuff. So I think those are all things that will will be discussed tomorrow, and, and then uh, I'll be happy to report back to council. Uh, Denise, I see you come online. You want to add something to that? I think you covered most of it. So with the stage three opening today announcement effective Friday, we certainly would have to look at what's a reasonable timeline to get playgrounds reopened. Certainly, similar to splash pads, it's sort of um, I guess an expectation that they're an important part of the community. Um, as the mayor said, we just have to review the sanitization protocol and the utilization. And most likely, you know, probably within days, it won't be Saturday that we could be open, but we could probably ensure that by Monday or Tuesday with some planning that they're reopened with some signage as well that we would have to install at a later date. Okay. Um, did the town of Shelburne uh, purchase a fogger? Yes, we did. Okay. All right. Just, just 
that could help, I, I guess. Um, I guess my next uh, question might be directed at Jim. Um, just wondering, I've noticed that the shared bike, um, I don't know if we want to call them shared bike lanes, uh, the, the decals are a little, they're showing some wear. Is there any um, plans to repaint those this year or is that like a, an every other year kind of thing? Uh, through your worship, no, we are we are planning on repainting those this year. Uh, okay. When the, uh, when any of the markings go down, uh, the initial markings, mm -hmm. uh, until you have a, a base built up on them over a couple of years, uh, they do tend to fade faster. So the next round of painting should definitely uh, improve their uh, longevity. Uh, we're finishing up our parking lot painting first and stop mm -hmm. bars for mm -hmm. our uh, uh, they traffic end of it first and then the guys are going to switch over we already have the, uh, the green paint and the markings all ordered and everything so uh, as soon as they're done their normal stuff we can switch over to that so awesome thank you very much you're welcome council bernardo while i'm not really fond of these zoom meetings can i ask the question of when we can get together since 100 people are now allowed to gather because uh outdoors outdoors yeah but indoors i think there's a there's a larger number even there yeah so it's it's 50 indoors as of friday um still with with physical distancing distancing measures in place so so we still would have have to create an environment where at least two meters between each person is is doable. Mm -hmm. um, that would include council members, staff members, as well as any other members of public who may want to attend. So I, I think that's something else we'll we'll be talking about tomorrow um, going forward. You know what what availability we have in terms of facilities that that could manage that. I, I hear you. I mean I'm I'm not a, a big fan of of conducting business this way. I mean it, it's it's been a great you know, sort of gap filler, I guess, for lack of a better term through, through this period of time. But uh, I mean, it, it would be nice to, to, to be able to sit face to face at, at some point in the near future. Um, but, but again, we just, we have to find a way that we can do that and accommodate the number of people that may likely show up with the physical distancing requirements. Can I suggest the arena floor where the ice surface is? We can put a lot of people in that area. Uh, Denise? Through the mayor, when we had outlined the original uh, COVID-19 impacts and how that affected council meetings, we had outlined that the budget was including the estimated cost to rent the town and country room at the CDRC and the capacity in there for future council meetings, since our current council chambers and the Grace Tippling Hall would not comply with the physical distancing of two meters. Um, using that halt, that that center will be conditional upon when they reopen, but certainly community centers and arenas were in the list of facilities under stage three that were announced today as well. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in our council chambers right now by myself and, and you know, without exaggerating, I'm taking a look around, you know, in order to maintain physical distancing of two meters, you know, Four. might be the accommodation of two, maybe three additional people in here. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it goes without saying that, you know, we won't be meeting back in this room where I'm sitting, um, you know, in, in the near future. But, but to Denise's point, yeah, that earlier report did include some discussion about, about the town and country room upstairs at the arena. Um, and, and probably for most meetings, that would be sufficient space. Um, you know, if, if, if we're expecting kind of the, the average number of, of public attendees that were coming out prior to prior to the pandemic. Um, I mean, if, if we have some agendas with, with some hot button issues where we're expecting larger crowds, then, then that may be, you know, maybe insufficient, but I, I think for most going forward that could probably be accommodated in that room. Uh, in all honesty, your, your worship, there wouldn't be any place in the whole town if we have a hot button issue to accommodate the amount of people that would come out. So that would be the outdoor, even then a hundred people, you know, we couldn't accommodate. So I'm, I'm just, like I said, I'm not fond of Zoom, I'm kind of getting tired of Zoom uh, meetings. So I'm, I'm hoping that it's, you know, with the arena opening up, we can at least council can get itself together if nothing else and 
zoom out to other people maybe or something. I don't know. Just, you know, so that we can at least discuss a little easier than trying to find the mute button on this stupid computer from time to time. It's, it's heartening to know that you miss us. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do to, to get back in the same room physically sooner rather than later. Uh, Deputy Mayor Anderson, did I, did I see your hand there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I add to that, uh, Mayor Mills, uh, I think uh, Walter misses making fun of my car in the parking lot. Um, but uh, <laughs> we'll get there soon, Walter. Don't worry about it. Um, I, I want to take this uh, opportunity to uh, thank uh, Jim and his team at, uh, at the Public Works Department. I've gotten over Twitter um, some uh, concern from a, a resident in my subdivision about some wild brush growing behind his, his house and uh, was quite frustrated about it and, and what a town could do to sort of address that. And I had reached out to uh, Jim and I would say within just a matter of days, uh, him and his team was over there taking care of the situation and the resident was uh, completely clear. I just wanted to, uh, I know this was uh, a while back, but the saying is better late than never. Uh, so I just wanted to thank you uh, publicly for the work that you and your team are doing. Okay, great. Jim, if you could pass that along to uh, to the rest of the public works employees. Uh, we'll do all first thing tomorrow morning. Good. All right, any other inquiries before we start on the, uh, marathon session of our regular agenda. No? Okay. Well, let's get at it. Uh, so the first item is, uh, is a report from Aspernet and Associates, or Associates rather, uh, which is included in the agenda dated July 8, 2020, regarding sewage capacity allocation for the uh, 2019 year end. Steve, take it away. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm not sure whether uh, Jennifer wanted to put up the uh, presentation or if everyone, uh, the report, or if everyone has it in front of them, I'm uh, fine for sort of talking through uh, through the report. So um, essentially what we've done is uh, look at uh, the sewage allocation for year end 2019. Uh, just for council's information, this is generally a report that is done uh, each year. Um, however, there was not a 2018 report uh, completed at the time. There wasn't uh, a lot of applications in front of us. So this report actually, although it summarizes 2019, actually picks up 2018 uh, and 19 together. I'm, I'm not gonna go through, there's a lot of numbers. There's a lot of uh, calculations through this report. Um, I'm not gonna go through every single page. I'll maybe highlight on a few things uh, that I think may be of importance to council. Um, one thing which uh, you may see on table one, uh, page two of the report, is essentially the sewage uh, flows to the uh, sewage treatment plant have continued to rise as expected over the years with uh, increased population growth and, uh, and new developments coming online. The one thing that we have seen as a positive trend is actually more to the, the far, far right column, which is that the flows per capita of sewage have generally stayed the same or, or kind of uh, flatlined uh, for, for lack of a better term. So this is very positive in our perspective from the point that if you look back into 2007, all the way through to about 2012, prior to a lot of the uh, implementation of uh, uh, cutting off flows, infiltration, uh, things like that, uh, optimization of the system, which council took a, a really hard line approach on with some, some large capital projects and annual maintenance projects has really cut down uh, those flows getting into the system. So I think that's very positive to bring forward from this. Continuing forward, and again, I, I'm not gonna go into the details. We essentially, subtract uh, water from sewage and work our way through to figure out the exact uh, flow uh, that is anticipated based on uh, based on the sewage numbers moving forward and uh, ultimately because we have seen that flatlining of the uh, flows we have uh, adjusted the per uh, liter per person amount um, down to the highest of the last five years we had previously been holding 
the highest flow from I think it was 2012. And uh, we now feel comfortable that because that flow has, has somewhat flatlined, we will just ho hold the highest from the, the last five years, which is 242 uh, liters per person um, um, per day. The other thing uh, that you'll see in, in this one, it would be on table five on page uh, six of eight, is that, um, and I did indicate that this would eventually happen the last time I presented this report, is that usually we would either uh, look at flows based on a three-year average or a five-year average. Uh, historically, we have compared to the five-year average just because it was higher, holding some of those uh, previously historical high flows. We have now seen with the trending of new homes being built and new flow coming in, that the three-year average is actually now significantly surpassed the five-year average. So we do think it's more conservative to use the three-year average and, and we have switched to that as we uh, indicated in our last report would most likely happen. So moving forward on the actual allocations themselves, maybe before actually uh, sort of saying some of the changes, I'll, I'll direct counsel to the uh, page that has been attached uh, to the back of the report. This is a page that uh, Steve Weaver and myself have worked on uh, several times now and really keeps track of, uh, of all the current allocations as well as potential future development. Um, Council will see on the uh, top left uh, column uh, that the three-year average is uh, 2,542 cubic meters per day of the rated plant capacity of 3,420 uh, cubic meters per day. So ultimately that leaves us with a, an available uh, capacity at the existing sewage plant of 878 uh, cubic meters uh, per day. We, we have had to build in contingencies and this is uh, standard with, uh, with all reports. And really what this is, the 17 residential units represent the homes that people have moved into partway through the year or at the tail end of the year. So this really accounts for because we don't, don't have their full year's uh, flow that we're accounting for those folks and, and making sure that we're not missing those in the numbers. The 66 residential units and the existing uh, uh, commercial and institutional are existing facilities within the town of Shelburne boundaries that are still on septic systems. And we do need to hold that capacity if their septics fail or they get to the point where they need to connect to the system, um, that, that capacity needs to be held there. The last number uh, though I do have highlighted in yellow on this uh, table, uh, you'll see a stabilization for uh, infiltration uh, reduction. And this is set at 75 cubic meters now. In the past, that number was held at 150 cubic meters. This was because we were still concerned that there could be a, a large variance or that we might get some high flows that peaked up. And what we have found now is that the, the system is uh, very much improved over the years from the infiltration and the uh, lining work that, that Jim's team has uh, carried forward with. And we are comfortable now uh, reducing that number down to 75 from the, the 150 that was held before. So when we take that into consideration, what we essentially have to hold for uh, existing units within uh, town boundaries, our actual available capacity goes down to 733. We have then uh, included in the table all of the committed allocations that have been committed by council and with support from uh, staff reports um, for the stage one, stage two, and stage three areas uh, that have currently committed capacity. Those allocations to date uh, total up to 514 uh, cubic meters a day which would leave us with the uh, green highlighted box of 219 cubic meters capacity. Uh, for council's benefit, you'll see that we've just added a little line there below that, that indicates that equates to approximately 268 residential units or approximately 7.82 hectares of, uh, 
of ICI, gross floor area. Um, we've just done that to bring it into context. It's, it's not both, it's one or the other, um, but just, just I know it's sometimes hard to get your head around cubic meters a day and a little easier on residential units. So the next area uh, of the table. Sorry, Sorry Steve. So j just before we move on, 268 residential units or, or how many? Uh, 7.82 hectares. So that would be what, 78, 78,000, just over uh, 78,000 uh, square meters of institutional, commercial or uh, industrial. Okay. okay, thank you, sorry. No problem. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We have then, uh, just because uh, through planning and engineering uh, and with the town staff's assistance, we've been keeping a pretty good handle on the potential areas within the town boundaries, potential applications. So we actually have set out uh, the stage one, two, and three areas for uh, potential residential and potential uh, institutional, commercial, and industrial. So the next area are applications that could come forward. These are not current applications and are not actually uh, in front of council yet. This is just a tracking of, of uh, what we have uh, kept track of. And that shows within the town boundaries, there is the potential for an additional 521 uh, cubic meters of of necessary capacity. So really what this tells us is that as we move forward in approving applications and as we move forward in looking at these different pieces, uh, there will be a necessity to prioritize and, and really uh, determine which applications um, would take that priority of the, of the 219 uh, cubic meters available. Um, at this point, we're really just asking council to uh, receive the report. We don't have any current applications in front of us that would mandate a decision from council, but we did feel like it uh, required the awareness for council of where we stood, uh, that we'd accounted for all currently committed capacity and that there is still some capacity uh, remaining. However, going through this report, it does make it clear that an expansion or some sort of uh, ability uh, to in, increase the capacity of the sewage treatment plant will be required to accommodate all of the existing uh, development that could happen within the town boundaries. And as per the previous presentation is uh, definitely required for what we would be referring to as stage four, uh, being those uh, lands that uh, would eventually come into the town, uh, the town boundaries. Okay, thank you. I see Councilor Bonato's hand up. So um, it sounds like we've always done the first come first serve, but at some point it sounds like we're going to have to say to people, "Sorry, you're out of luck. You're done. You can't. You can't go forward because we've committed everything that we have." Am I correct in that thought process? Yeah, through you, uh, Mayor, to uh, Councillor Bonato, there, there will be a stage where that will happen. Um, at this point, um, there, there is approximately double the amount of uh, potential uh, that there is actual capacity. And as I think Council appreciates, and I've had this discussion before, this can sometimes be a moving target because you are trying to base it on population, you're basing it on flows. So that's why we add some of those uh, conservative pieces into it. But at this point, uh, yeah, there's a, there's only about uh, somewhere between 40% and 50% uh, capacity available without going through the expansion. Um, to be fair, this is part of the reason why we did initiate the uh, class environmental assessment. And uh, it was somewhat known that as we get near the end of this, we were awful close in the last report uh, that, that there would be that need for, uh, for additional capacity. And this is part of the reason we did initiate that process as well. So if I can continue, Steve, does that include ICI or is there still a reserve beyond the 268 left over? So, so this includes, there is a, uh, 
I guess there is an ICI um, uh, component that has been included, um, but this this is projecting forward for that entire ICI uh, piece, Walter. So that's included in that 268 or, or 7.82 hectares, uh, whatever you call it there. Um, now, even with the EA, if we had, we've initiated the EA, we're looking at a potential, how many years before we would be able to say to people, we've got capacity for you? So at this point, we have projected under a, a best case scenario that our plan is to wrap up the uh, second, sorry, the third PIC uh, this August or, or late summer. That would allow us to post the, um, the report as a final report. There is a 30 day review process to that. At that point, we have suggested there is at least a year of design uh, work uh, that would be associated with that uh, detailed design. And then there's approximately 18 months to two years of construction. So we're probably looking to answer the question at about a three year time frame uh, from basically the end of the summer as to when that additional capacity could be available. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Steve? Okay. For a motion to receive Steve's report for information then. Moved by Councillor Fegan, seconded by Councillor Wegner. All in favor? Carried. All right, thanks Steve. Uh, next up we have the planning and development update from our planner, Steve Weaver. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I am going to just share, I just have three quick slides um, and they relate back to what um, Steve was just presenting in terms of the allocation, um, because that's a good segue into um, the planning update. So hopefully you'll see a map on your screen. Yeah. You see it? So the reference to the stage areas in the letter from Espernet Associates is from your uh, from the town's official plan. So this is the development staging plan at Schedule B1. Um, there's a set of policies that go with this in the official plan that um, guide you know staff and council on uh, when there's issues of um, limited capacity remaining um, or there's an issue of multiple developments. Um, uh, seeking approvals and there's not enough for for uh, everyone to get their approval um, at that time. There's some guidance there about what should be prioritized. Um, staging is part of that because logically you want to stage areas that are closer to the infrastructure and can use existing infrastructure first and, and then those that require new infrastructure and outward expansion um, kind of go down the, the list. Um, the other things that could become priorities is if, for example, a development is um, bringing on stream uh, a much needed um, business or a type of housing that, um, you know, the town has been seeking, such as affordable housing or seniors housing, the policies provide guidance that those kinds of applications could get priority. At this stage, we're not at a point where we have development applications in the hopper that we have to worry about you know, do we have enough capacity to process these applications? Um, but we've been starting to advise developers there may need to be a phasing approach to their developments uh, when it gets to the approval stage. Um, so that obviously we're not in a situation of committing to providing the service um, before it's available. Um, so this relates to the active developments and the developments that are actually, um, you know, summarized in my report and, and what you're seeing out in, um, in the town. Um, the summer during construction season. So um, you can see um, in the stage one area, there are uh, first of all, some infill lots that have been approved. So it's not a big ticket item, but there's nine units allocated there that we're holding for. Um, some of those have been approved for construction and, and others, um, they're just severed lots at this point um, or even conditionally severed. Um, Stage, also in stage one, the only other allocated development is, is 600 Main Street for 58 units. Um, that developer you know, has recently received approval for their sales trailer. So 
they're going to begin marketing and then hopefully we'll see some development happening there, um, you know, subject to further uh, agreements and so forth uh, in the next uh, year or two. Um, stage two, obviously you're familiar with Highland Village. Um, it's under construction. Occupancies of the first few units has just started happening this week, um, or sorry, the last two weeks and uh, will continue through the summer and fall. And there's still probably another year and a half to two and a half years of building activity in that subdivision anticipated based on the, um, the pace uh, of construction and the uh, remaining units. Um, stage two also has the Stone Ridge development draft approved for 33 townhouse units. Um, that developer is currently working uh, their way through the detailed design process and SBA has been reviewing the engineering plans. Um, and the last residential development on the map here with allocated service is the field gate development. So that's the largest, uh, 250 units have been allocated. Um, they are obviously in their site preparation uh, process. They're also in their detailed design process. So they've made their second submission recently and hope to get development agreements in place to start some of their site servicing before the end of the year um, and related highway improvements. Um, the blue notes are the ICI developments. Um, so you will, if you go up Highway 10, you'll see that there's three buildings under construction there in the Summerhill Plaza. Uh, we've held ICI allocation for those, uh, includes the Tim Hortons and then two commercial retail unit buildings. Um, in the industrial park, um, there is a um, storage facility under construction as well as the water bottling facility. So some allocated um, capacity to those two developments. Um, Turnstone has um, some additional um, development approved, hasn't been permitted yet through the building permit process. Um, and I think that covers it for ICI. In terms of, this is where we get into the bottom part of the table that Steve presented. So these are the developments that are on the horizon, you know, beyond what's already been allocated. Applications haven't been received yet, but we know that these are, are just a matter of time. And that most of these have had some kind of pre-application consultation where the, uh, they're getting ready, um, they're, they're processing or preparing the application for submission. Um, we've recently, um, Obviously, Fieldgate has been draft approved, so I've identified the medium high density block there. That's potential for another 75 units. Um, we do have um, some proposals as well for the stage one area. Um, application and process for um, Owen Sound Street at First Ave. And, um, and that development has kind of been on hold, but that, that was 48 or 44 apartments. Um, and then another 40 units of intensification potential have been identified um, and, and uh, you know, specific applications there, but infill apartments and second units and that kind of thing. Um, we've had discussions and, and pre-application meetings with um, Stone Ridge on uh, future development plans for their phase two where 33 apartment units um, could be possible in their future development block. And then west of that, Stone Ridge is also working on some concepts for uh, land at Main and John Street, where they've identified potential for 120 units. Um, south of that, uh, 501 Main Street West, the IK World property, is also um, likely to see an application for redevelopment to residential for upwards of 125 units. Haven't received that application yet. Um, so those are the residential potentials um, that have been identified. And then the blue show the commercial. I won't go through all of them, but to highlight the one that's been most anticipated, I think um, outside of the downtown core um, is the field gate development. We have now received their site plan application for a large uh, commercial development there. So you'll be hearing more about that probably towards the end of the summer um, with site plan approvals in process. Um, in the uh, industrial park, there's still quite a bit of uh, land available for additional development. Um, so that we've held uh, capacity or identified that up to four hectares of floor area could be possible there. And then there have been some ongoing discussions as well about the um, Greenbrook Village commercial blocks um, and as well as 313 Main Street West near Highland Village. So 
um, lots of people looking for opportunities and um, there's land on Victoria Street as well, identified for industrial development south of the Stella Jones property. Um, so this is where um, those numbers are coming from in the tables that, that Steve presented. Um, last thing I wanted to highlight on this slide is the two areas of uh, urban expansion. Uh, those we've referred to here as the stage four areas. So those are the areas that entirely depend on these wastewater plant upgrades. Some of these other developments might be fully accommodated within the current plant. Um, some of them might be partially accommodated within the current plant and then rely for future phases on, on re-rating. And then some of these, um, if they're the last ones kind of in the queue, um, may even rely on the, on the full plant uh, re-rating process. Um, other than all those development applications, you know, in addition to that, it's been a busy uh, spring and summer for planning in Shelburne. Um, the new uh, subdivisions, Greenbrook and Summerhill, for example, a lot of decks, sheds, pools. I think a lot of people spending time in their backyard uh, this year uh, for, for obvious reasons and uh, doing some upgrades. So a lot of investment in people's properties this year uh, has been keeping us very busy. The other kind of half of my report deals with um, the process for urban boundary expansion. Um, this relates very much to the Flato delegation as the largest landowner in the expansion area. Um, I think council is basically familiar with the process that is required here. Um, it's called the Municipal Comprehensive Review. Um, that is a study that has to be done at the county level. Um, it, there is no local municipal comprehensive review under the growth plan anymore. Um, in my report, I've just tried to clarify a few matters. There, there's often interchangeable reference between built boundary and urban boundary. Those are actually two different things. The urban boundary is, is uh, kind of the limit of where we can entertain applications for urban development right now. Um, it's the boundary that we would need to expand to allow more land uh, to be made available for development. Um, the built boundary uh, is a line that was drawn by the province back in 2006. It's what was at the time a limit of existing built up areas in Shelburne. It, it's drawn for the purpose of measuring what's called intensification. Um, under the official plan, 38% of development is supposed to be within that built up area. Um, so the steps involved in the MCR process involve what's called a land needs assessment. The county has to do this um, evaluation across the county, inventory, how much land is available for development, how much housing and commercial development is actually needed to meet the forecasts identified in the growth plan, and then identify on the balance sheet if there's a surplus or shortage. We're fully anticipating a shortage will be identified and that Shelburne will be um, you know, top of the list in terms of opportunity for expansion, um, but the county may need to look at other expansion opportunities as well. Um, certainly Orangeville and Grand Valley being the other two major candidates as the only other serviced urban areas, uh, but there is some greater flexibility now with the province for development in the unserviced or partially serviced settlement areas as well throughout the county. The second step of that assessment is really where we get into the details of how do we service those expansion areas? Um, is that financially viable? Um, are there water, wastewater and stormwater master plans and environmental assessments to support that? Transportation matters has that been looked at? What are the agricultural impacts? All of those steps. So that's a, um, a joint effort between the county and the town to figure out, you know, we, assuming the land is justified for expansion from a numbers perspective, is it viable? We believe it is, but there's going to be need, more detail that needs to be put to that. Um, when all that work is done, which is supposed to be, um, you know, to allow for the county official plan to be amended by July 1st, 2022, um, the urban boundary in theory would be changed in the county OP. That would go to the province for approval. The province, I think, has six months to consider approval of that. And in the meantime, the town can start working on updating its official plan. We have one year to update the town's OP under the Planning Act to make sure that it conforms with the updated county OP. We would also have to update the Shelburne West Secondary Plan. And then once all of that is in place or nearing, nearing finalization, 
that's where we're at a stage where development applications in those expansion areas can be entertained. Um, at the development approval stage is where we would recommend conversations about developers entering into agreements to prepay development charges and fund major infrastructure. Uh, we wouldn't recommend that those types of agree agreements be entered into before, you know, for example, the land being designated for development or for, before sort of draft or conditional approvals. Um, because the planning process really should um, unfold and, and be fully vetted before uh, any commitments are made uh, with respect to financing the, the, the infrastructure through a development charge agreement. Um, lastly, in my report, I've just captured a, a brief update with some provincial announcements. There's been another announcement uh, since the two letters that were received on June 22nd. Um, the major one and, and county council received an update from WSP on this last Thursday um, is the extended population and employment forecasts in the growth plan through proposed amendment one, as well as a land needs methodology. That's what the county has really been waiting for and what it needs from the province to be able to do that work. Um, that's a draft, it's available for comment until the end of July. Um, we expect that that would come into place probably towards the end of the summer. And then from there, the county can do its work on the land needs assessment. Um, the other update is just quickly, the province removed the pause on Planning Act timelines. So we are kind of back to business as usual, other than just holding meetings virtually instead of in person um, for Planning Act purposes, the, the regular rules apply. Um, the, the most recent announcement was there are some more updates proposed uh, with the legislation for community benefits strategies and for development charges funding. So you'll hear more about that as we move into the next phase of the development charges study and, and we have Hemson back to council to provide those updates. Um, I just wanted to highlight one more thing, obviously through the um, preparation for the transportation master plan work, we've been talking to the Ministry of Transportation there has been some staff changes there that, that has affected that a little bit. Um, but we do have um, what appears to be some support at the staff level to um, likely partner with us on a study to figure out how highway access on Highway 89 uh, west of town uh, could be coordinated with future development there. Um, MTO has full control over that access uh, on the west side of town. And so it wouldn't meet their intersection spacing requirements. So similar to the Shelburne East area study, we would have to do a West area transportation study, uh, which we're recommending should be considered as part of a transportation master plan. Um, and uh, those are my comments and I'm happy to take any questions regarding the report. Thank you. Okay. Questions for Steve. Uh, I have Councillor Buffett and Councillor Bonato, then Deputy Mayor Anderson. Councillor Buffett, you're, you're muted. Councillor Buffett, you're muted. There we go. Okay. Um, Steve, you were mentioning that uh, by July 1st of 2022, the county's official plan would be likely approved by that time is that correct that's the deadline that the county has to adopt at the county level um the amendments to the county op it then goes to the province though as the approval authority okay the province has some time to approve it so once the once the province approves that would we be in a position even though we haven't got our amendments to our official plan done yet to start looking at um future applications in that new area in the west area if the outcome of the county OP um, identifies that the boundary would be expanded and that there don't seem to be any provincial concerns about that, I think in conjunction with updating the secondary plan and, um, you know, amending the town's OP to reflect all that information, we could start to entertain development applications. So we can do that, say, possibly next year sometime? Uh, well, be, be, beyond 2022, yeah, beyond yeah. the mid-2022. The reason I'm asking that is because you, you were talking before, and it's also in your report on um, step number five about early payment of development charges, and we just heard a presentation earlier from Plato regarding the upfronting of development charges. So would they be able to start looking at doing that at that point in time and start working on applications so that they would be ready once all the 
um, uh, work has been done and everything is ready to go for that land to come into the actual boundary? So I think um, we're going to have to take some time to consider that um, as, as this process unfolds. Um, I'm a little leery about going too far into the application process um, before, say, the council has, and, and public have fully vetted and, and considered, you know, the amendments that are proposed more broadly. Um, you know, although Flato is the major landowner on the west side, we have to make sure we plan for that area comprehensively and, and factor in its full development. Um, so we, we would like to get an application process underway as quickly as possible so that when the town is updating its OP, you can take advantage of that time to also have an application in process so that it doesn't have to wait. And then you have another year long process beyond the town's OP update to get through the applications. Um, and also the applications are actually feeding some valuable information into the OP update process. So right. um, we're going to continue to work with Flato's team to, to move the process as synergistically and, and quickly as possible. Um, the county has been very clear that they will not consider any applications uh, for urban expansions privately initiated and that they will not anticipate um, any, would not ex process any applications uh, for development in an expansion area that hasn't been approved in their OP yet. Um, so we do have to wait to beyond that 2022 date uh, to start the application process. Um, the financial strategy, I think by that time for wastewater plan upgrades should be well in hand and we would have a better mm -hmm. picture of what the phasing of that would look like and what role development charges will play. And I think that will be very helpful to have them, those initial conversations about how do we consider prepayment uh, to get that process going so that there's less of a financial burden uh, at the front end of the process. Yeah, well, that's where I was sort of leading in terms of the actual financing being up front, and if we can start use some of those funds once we're in the process, instead of you know having to be short of funds or having to get into more debt than we need to, if we're yeah. able to pay for part of that up front. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, you know in order to really have those conversations, we, we need to better understand what the EA recommendations are and what what the final costs will be to make sure that those questions of financial viability can be answered and, and answered mm -hmm. confidently, and then. And then we can get the breakdown of what costs can be assigned to development charges and what costs have to be otherwise financially um, planned for so that we can, um, you know, have a comprehensive plan going forward. Right. So then those development charges for that west area, that new area, would be in addition to the existing new development charges that we have now. Is that correct? Yes, there will need to be a development charge um, update uh, that would factor in the costs, the final cost for the wastewater plan upgrades. Um, now, there has been some consideration to that through the latest DC update. So the wastewater costs um, have factored in what, what Hampson referred to as post-period growth. So basically growth beyond, you know, um, what, what those uh, initial um, capacities are in the town systems. Um, and uh, so some costs have been built in. Um, they may not reflect the true final cost, but that's why we can update this every few years to make sure we can update those costs. Okay. And then the, the other thing was, um, one of the items that the planner for Flato had mentioned was the uh, housing for the seniors and the affordable housing. Um, would that be something that we would be able to start working on after all of that, that um, official plan is taken care of and we're getting into our own official plan amendment and get that moving? Yeah, I mean, whether it's a small phase of development or the entire thing, that the, the same kind of rules apply. It's um, if you're in an area that's outside the current urban boundary, you really have to wait till that MCR process has been completed and the county OP has been updated to to bring that land in. Um, and then, um, yeah, if there's smaller pieces and, and initial phases that can be moved forward more quickly. Um, then we're all ears and, and, and very eager to, to look at that. Um, it's, it does have to fit into the, you know, it's one piece of a larger right. puzzle, so we have to make sure it fits properly. But um, if some priority type developments come forward, you know, I think that will be an important consideration uh, for the town service and plans as well. Yeah, that's what I was just looking at in terms of priority things. Yeah. That, cause that's something that we really need badly. Yes. Not here, but everywhere. Absolutely. Okay, so, so just to be clear, Steve, 
I mean, basically, you know, we, we really have to wait for the county's MCR to be completed. But once once that is done, you know, th then then we we will be in a position where we can sort of concurrently look at at planning applications at the same time that we're also going through our own OP amendment process. Correct. Okay. Okay. Uh, Councilor Bernardo. Um, I think I pretty well asked most of my questions, but basically we're looking at a two year process here and it's beyond because I, what I'm hearing is 2022, correct? Correct. So that's the next council's problem, really not ours, because we'll be in election mode by then. <laughs> if I'm, if I'm understanding everything. It's beyond, it's be, going to almost be beyond this council's term before it comes up. You know, unless by, uh, you know, some miracle, I've never seen these processes, <laughs> um, you know, these MCR processes happen quicker than they say they will. Um, I, I, I'm optimistic that this one will be um, not too bad because the growth plan has been simplified, I'll say. It's not as extensive in its requirements as the 2017 growth plan. And the county just did its official plan in 2015. So there's good information to work with. Um, the county's consultants are very, um, um, really prioritizing the project and wanting to make sure it gets done by tw mid 2022 as well. The one thing I will say is that the tw 2006 growth plan had a 2009 compliance deadline and some areas such as Simcoe County did not complete it till 2019. So it can take longer and the province hasn't created any kind of planning jail for municipalities that don't comply. They haven't come back and you know, <laughs> you know, drop the hammer on those municipalities. Um, but I think there's a lot of reasons there'll be pressure on the county and the local municipalities of Dufferin to get this done quickly. Um, for all the reasons that you heard tonight, uh, you know, land is going to become a shortage. It, it really is a shortage already. So, but, but basically, we can all say the flat out straight out, you're going to have to wait two years. Yeah, that's, that's the minimum for considering applications. In the meantime, we will consider continue pre-application consultation. Um, there's some limited feedback that be given on technical matters. Um, there's obviously the master plan processes that will have public input opportunities and FLATA will be a key stakeholder. Um, so we're not going to just sit on our hands and not be talking to them the whole time. This will be a, a conversation that goes um, and, and there will be a lot of value in that to your process towards the development applications that are, are ultimately required. And, and I guess presumably, Steve, I mean, you know, the, the ability to have those conversations now presumably will speed up the application process once once that happens because you know a lot of the background a lot of you know the, the things that wouldn't come up ordinarily in, until an application has been filed can can maybe be you know dealt with at, at least in a cursory sense but before the application actually is is made for sure Am yeah I wrong with that assumption or no not at all um you know i think one of the challenges for the land areas that we're talking about to date has been there has not been a um a developer with the experience and the consulting team and the expertise coming forward to actually conceptualize what the development could look like. So in the absence of that, it's all it's all high level estimates and, and best guesses of what could happen. And now we have some, some more uh, crystallized visions of what this could look like. And that helps to inform secondary plan updates, master plans, um, you know, complete the puzzle so that uh, when those applications can be processed, there aren't any surprises new technical issues that we weren't aware of, it will already have crossed those bridges by that point. So, so notwithstanding that we'll have to wait, I mean, that, that interim period will not, not be entirely wasted time. Correct. Yeah. And, and I guess my final question is on the uh, bypass. The MTO, you, you mentioned you're talking to the MTO about bypass. We're talking still going out the fourth line. Or are we talking just strictly going out 89 highway when we're talking to MTO? Like which, like I, when I was listening to your presentation, I got the feeling you were talking about 89, a study for 89 West. So, 
I think you put yourself on mute there, Councilor Renato. <laughs> Sorry, I must have muted myself somewhere. Press the wrong button. In, in, the process, in the process, you were, that's why I hate Zoom. In the process, you were talking about talking to MTO about the bypass, and then you started talking about Highway 89 West improvement study needed. I got sort of a little bit, what are we talking to MTO about? Are we talking to them about the fourth line? And at the same time, trying to get the West End 89 improvements or like a sort of trying to figure out what are we talking to them about? What's, what's... All of the above. So um, the, the conversations to date have really been focused on the bypass. Um, you know, obviously looking at is there are there options here and would the MTO support doing more study to define an, uh, a route and ultimately towards the cost of creating a route. I don't think those conversations are going any further without having more technical analysis and the transportation master plan is the perfect study to do that analysis. You know, is a bypass warranted based on the current and projected future truck traffic volumes and what other route alternatives that may be possible out there, recognizing the town doesn't control the roadways. Um, that's kind of fundamental to what needs to happen on the west side, because if that will continue to carry current and growing truck traffic, we need to be very cognizant of that when intersections are designed for new residential developments and how residential development is designed. Um, and so not having answers on that makes it a little bit difficult to answer questions around development configuration and that kind of thing. But the other major factor that MTO has um, control over is similar to you know, what Fieldgate is doing right now, designing, you know, completing NEA, doing intersection improvements. Um, there needs to be relief from MTO intersection spacing requirements in order for the flat of lands or other west side properties to have access to the highway. Right now, based on intersection spacing requirements, the MTO would not permit any access to Highway 89 west of Highland Village. Um, that's not workable from a development standpoint. So you said we need technical studies to prove to MTO that we need a bypass. Correct. When are we doing them? That will be part I of the... Been, I, I thought we, we had done some of those studies already when we were looking at 124 and 89 is the amount of truck traffic we already have in this town, which is enormous. Yeah, there's been a number of, like, there's been the Shelburne East Area study, there's been a number of traffic impact studies for various developments in the town, but the last bypass study I think was done in 2007 or 8, um, and traffic conditions have changed quite a bit since then. Um, so there needs to be an update to that. One of the reasons it hasn't been done yet you know, or why we wouldn't have recommended the town do that detailed bypass warrant analysis is that the county did mention that they would do some of that analysis as part of the county transportation assessment. Um, so we wanna make sure that the two studies are very well coordinated and that that assessment is done as close to when you can start to realize some development as possible so that by the time development's happening, it's not stale dated already. So, um, that will be, you know, front and center as part of the terms of reference for the TMP uh, that we would recommend be done, but we, we still are missing some pieces on what the county will be doing on that, what level of analysis and where we can fill in the gaps. Just, just to that point too, and, and not to get too far down the garden path, but, but the last meeting we had with, with MTO staff, uh, Councilor Bernardo, I mean, yeah, yeah we, we have traffic counts and, and all of that kind of stuff, but, but I think what, what they're really looking for, you know, by way of a data set to justify the need is, you know, how, how any potential bypass would, would integrate into the larger transportation network. So, so they had talked specifically about transportation master plans. And, and particularly at the county level, Dufferin County uh, doesn't currently have any sort of transportation master plan, so to speak. Um, and, and I think that's, that's kind of rare amongst, you know, upper tier governments. Um, so, I mean, that, that's one of the things that, that I've been talking to the county staff about as well, that, you know, that, that really would, would help our case with MTO if, if we can, you know, provide some sort of, uh, 
you know, master plan at, at a county level showing how all of the, the transportation networks are going to integrate. So, Your Worship, going back, I guess, to you now at this point, is there any point in us as a town doing it or, or just let the county do it? Which, which is, where should we be going between, you know what I'm saying? Like the end, oh, like the bypass. If we, if you talk to the citizens of this town, is and you know it, and I know it because we all heard it when we were campaigning. Is the most important thing on their mind. So it, it's been years and years waiting and waiting and waiting. So it, it, is it something we need to do, or the county can do it and handle it all? Like a, you know what I'm saying, or is it something we should start soon? I guess. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I think, you know, I think both pieces are are important. I mean, yeah, we, we should be doing our own work, but we also I think need that county component as well. Um, and and from you know from a provincial perspective, I, I think it helps. Um, you know, if, if the county identifies that as as a transport transportation need within the county, um, it, it might be a little easier to se secure a, a commitment from the provincial level if. if that messaging is coming from the upper tier as opposed to, to just the town of Shelburne. Uh, Denise? Through the mayor, I think given all the questions that uh, members of council are asking, it might be important that staff bring back a summary report of everything that we've been completing in terms of the discussions with MTO to give not only council, but the public an understanding of what steps in the process still need to be completed uh, some of the tremendous challenges that we need to face and would be obvious about estimated costs and routes and all the kinds of things that need to be completed as the mayor's also indicated, including a TMP at the county level um, for the MTO to assess this. They've been fairly honest with us that this was in a post 20 year projection. Um, we had the delegations at, at uh, Roma um, in the past, in the last couple of years, we haven't moved the pendulum that far forward. We have had some good dialogue, but we'll certainly gear up to maybe bring a report back to council at the first meeting in September, if that's something you believe would be helpful. Uh, that'd be great. That's it for me. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor Anderson, you were next on my list. Thanks, Mayor. Um, uh, to uh, Councillor Bernardo's point with respect to who should be taking the lead when it comes to the uh, bypass, uh, uh, Councillor Bernardo, I will mention that uh, myself, uh, the mayor and Denise had met actually with Sylvia Jones a while back ago discussing this very issue. And it was her position that the county really should uh, come up with something, some sort of agreement as to maybe where this should be. So maybe that's something that uh, the mayor and I could certainly push when we get back to the table and getting that ball rolling again. Because of the pandemic and some of the other issues, uh, including transit has been sort of put on the back burner, but that's something that we could uh, start to, or spark the flame again uh, on the uh, on the bypass. Uh, and I'm also hoping sort of transitioning to my, 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 my next point is that uh, it's now, I think after 8.30, so I'm hoping that before we continue with this laundry list of other things that we have to do, that we're gonna take a, a five minute break at some point. Um, just a, a quick, uh, question for, for Steve. Uh, many of my issues have been largely addressed by Councillor Bernardo and, and Councillor Buffett um, uh, about maybe possible dead time surrounding the Plato application. And so I'm glad to hear that uh, from Steve that ongoing conversations will be had uh, to ensure that uh, that process is being moved along efficiently. Um, when it comes to the, just two quick questions. You, you said, uh, you mentioned the sales center for the development that's happening on Main Street. Uh, sorry, when, when was that coming about? When did you say, Steve? So they received their zoning approval uh, for the temporary sales center. Um, I think that was either at the end of May or in June. I think it was the second meeting in May. Um, and uh, they've indicated that they, well, they have to submit a detailed plan for that yet, but I was anticipating they would have submitted that to get it into the site this month. Um, I haven't received the detailed plan yet, so I can check back with them to see what their timing is, but um, I think they are still planning to have it there this summer um, and then continue marketing efforts through the fall. Okay, and my, my second question to you, you referenced also in your report about uh, 
the Summerhill development. Uh, I was there myself not too long ago, so I, I was pleased to see that uh, they have something going up there. My understanding when they first came to council that that project was probably to be maybe further ahead than they are right now, but do you have a sense of when that project will be completed? So yeah, you're right. It, it is a bit behind schedule. Their, their construction was, uh, was temporarily shut down during COVID um, because of the uh, emergency orders, but um, the owners were in touch with me uh, actually just last Friday and have, um, the, in order to get to occupancy, they have to complete an agreement with MTO and signalize the intersection. And that's the time frame they're starting to run up against. They still want to get that intersection signalized this year. So they expect to start soon. One concern we've expressed is that we have Fieldgate on the east end of town looking to put their new intersection in in August. Uh, we have Tribute currently upgrading Main Street West right now for another few weeks. And this would add the third major gateway into the town would be under construction at the same time potentially. So we're, we're talking with MTO and all of those developers about how we can stagger these construction um, projects so that we don't have all three provincial highway gateways coming in um, at the same time on restricted lanes or something like that. Um, but I know they're pushing very hard in the North uh, Plaza to get that MTO agreement. And there was emails even this afternoon about the final cost estimates and the lighting design that MTO required changes to. Um, so that's, that's coming. And sorry about that, I had to mute it. Obviously my phone was ringing. My last question, and this may not be a fair question for you, Steve, but because you were talking about the industrial park area, uh, have you heard anything with respect to that uh, marijuana plant uh, that uh, was approved by council that's been sort of um, missing in action by way of any updates, by way of reports? Uh, is there any new information that you could provide at this time? The latest I have, and it's uh, this was from a couple of months ago, was that the owners there were still um, awaiting Health Canada approvals. So um, until they get that, they they can't, um, you know, pull building permits. So um, I I haven't heard from them as I say for a couple of months, but that was the last update I had. Okay. Any other questions for Steve? Okay. Look for a mover and seconder then to uh, receive report P2020 08 from the town planner for information. Moved by Councillor Buffett, seconded by Councillor Fegan. All in favor? It's carried. And to the Deputy Mayor's point, I think I could probably use a, a break myself. So why, why don't we take five minutes, six minutes? It's 8.59 by, by my clock here. Um, yeah, so why, why don't we be back by, uh, by 9.05?